Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank the Poetry Festival Singapore for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts on the relations between poetry and history. Poetry is a way that allows me to be honest with myself. Society needs us to block ourselves from ourselves in order to perform a kind of sustainability. Performance is key. Through performance, one learns to cope by gradually moving away from oneself as far as one possibly can. Poetry, however, insists to ask what, how, where I am, how I get here, what brings me here, what I have left behind, and even more harshly, helps me or forces me to face the connections between what I think I have left behind and where I am now. The freedom in free association helps me think through the unfree, the inevitable relations between apparently unrelated subjects, peoples, cultures, times. During my adolescence, one of my favorite poets was William Wordsworth. When I was studying him for exam and for pleasure, I didn't know that we were connected in ways much more mundane, much more material, and much more historical than I had thought. From the Prelude. But lovelier far this the paradise where I was reared in nature's primitive gifts favor no less and more to every sense delicious. Seeing that the sun and sky, the elements and seasons in the change do find their dearest fellow laborer there, the heart of man. A district on all sides, the fragrance breathing of humanity, man free, man working for himself with choice of time and place and object by his wants, his comforts, native occupations, cares, conducted unto individual ends or social, and still unfollowed by a train unwooed, and unthought of even simplicity and beauty and inevitable grace. In the past, I empathize in his work a yearning for unalienated labor and grace in nature, a yearning for something that indeed felt like paradise growing up in colonial urban capitalist Hong Kong. His universal man is free because he works only for himself, choosing the time and place for his labor, choosing the objects of his labor for both individual and communal benefits. And such is beauty and grace. This rendition of an undisturbed amalgamation of humanity and nature, free from the manipulation of the nation state, produces an affective identification from me, which almost immediately translated in my imagination into something like Tao Yuan Ming's um, Tao Hua Yuan Ji, Peach Blossom Spring. Little did I know, though, the material processes of imperial commerce and soon after conquest are deeply imbricated in the English romantic art that I loved, including painting and poetry. Little did I know, Wordsworth's capacity to imagine and construct a freedom indeed comes from a kind of cross-cultural referencing a freedom that depends on the exploitation of labor, of capital, someplace else. When he was glorifying the beauty and grace of the nature around him, he did have another nature in mind, a nature someplace else, one that was considered inferior to the one he was reared in. William's brother, John Wordsworth, joined the East India Company in 1788 
planning to make a fortune for himself and the Westworth family. He went to China for the first time in 1790, then from 1801 onwards, sailed to the East as a captain. William wrote, Thou wanderest the wide world about, unchecked by pride or scrupulous doubt, with friends to greet thee or without. By the late 18th century, the British established a monopoly of opium production in Bengal. In addition to undertaking company business, senior employees such as John were able to engage in private trading, especially profiting from trading Bengal rice and opium in Canton, so that he could support his talented sibling at home. William wrote, he encouraged me to persist in the plan of life which I had adopted. John revealed it as a most melancholy thing that William should suffer anxiety over money and that their best friend Coleridge should be forced to write for newspapers. This reads particularly ironic to me as the colony I grew up in was so thoroughly commercialized with its cultural development so deliberately dwarfed that all poets I know write or have written for newspapers, myself included. I wonder whether if Coleridge had indeed earned his living by writing for newspapers as I did daily, perhaps he may have no time for or may have better managed his own opium addiction. Captain John Worsworth went down with two thirds of his crew members, some 250 people, when his ship sank off the coast of England during a storm in February 1805. The rendition of Limits of Hope, Finality and Futurity of Life found echoes in me. About 180 years later, in the colony founded via the opium trade, and the wars that followed. From the prelude, I bowed low to God who thus corrected my desires. From one of the elegies, all vanished in a single word, a breath, a sound, and scarcely heard. Sea, ship, drowned, shipwreck, so it came the meek, the brave, the good was gone. He who had been our living John was nothing but a name. These historical processes also made my college education possible. Funded by a scholarship provided by the Jardine and Matheson Company, the one and only scholarship for students in the University of Hong Kong us at the time. History has it that it was William Jardine, the Scotsman known for his image as a gentlemanly capitalist. He who, after two decades of living and trading opium in Canton, suggested to Lord Palmerston to wage war on China and then take Hong Kong because his company ships had been using Hong Kong as a transshipment port. My college education in English literature, therefore, has been, in a non-metaphorical way, funded by opium money. It was at Hong Kong U English department that I met Lam Bing Kwan, also known as Ya Si, Ye Si, who has just joined the university as a teaching staff member in 1985. Yes, Europe after, after the rain. Caught in the rain, I seek shelter in a church and find in its solemnity people deep in meditation, others working. 
For how many years have you been here? How many wars have you been through? And how many eras of peace? How many uprisings and suppressions? Did homeless, travel-wearied people receive protection here? Have the supplicants been granted favors? Have the wounds been tended? I shiver in the cold. You don't seem to have heard my prayer. Your four walls are modeled. The ancient stories have turned into reliefs. In the flickering light and shadow, your magnificent stained glass windows conjure up eerie tales of the accidents and inevitabilities of history. Outside, it is still pouring. In the ruins made of skeletons, animal or human, or maps marked with wound and scars, at mist, walls half taken down and walls newly built. In the subconscious, overgrown with twining seaweed, I visit battles started by clashes of views and massacres incited by bigotry. I wipe away the rain on my nape, looking for a place to sit down for a rest. Such cold, dismal weather is indeed ideal for meditation. Are you tired too? You don't answer. Perhaps you don't hear me. The vacuum cleaner is too loud. You are engrossed in your morning cleaning. Yesi's prose poem paints an imagery of magnificent architecture, overshadowed by ruins and wounds of history. It's the object of address, the you in the poem, a Europe who has created and taken down wars, produced battles and massacres, or is it a church weathered by uprisings and suppressions, yet reluctant to respond to prayers of travel-weary people? Who is it that doesn't answer? Who doesn't hear? This deliberate conflation analyzes the philosophical and spiritual underpinnings of European cultural history, the historical mutual constructedness of its apparent mercy and violence. Even more poignantly, the poem ends abruptly with a third you, the sound of the vacuum cleaner, consider too loud. Therefore, you don't answer, perhaps you don't hear me. It disrupted the precious peace of quiet offered by the church to the traveler, but also brings us to the stark reality of a present Europe full of migrants, full of migrants who may be too tired to, as blue-collar workers, a legacy of colonialism, no less. I would like to share with you excerpts from two poems of mine, the first one written after Yesi's classic poem, Cloud Voyage, also about traveling, from the fourth stanza on. The air has thinned, the clouds grow thicker. The text in the suitcase turned to swirling dust up in the clouds, converging in a single mass, center nearly black. No, it's not rain. In the clouds, no rain. Thin and boundless blue. The beautiful white clouds are suddenly red, sitting here for a lifetime. The body and its flight mode, no overload, no crashing. All the books you've wanted to read for a lifetime are read. Take a zip of anonymous tea. No charge, no taste, pork, chicken, combo, or special order halal. Such an extravagant existence. A space with no seasons. This is in Hong Kong. Get some sleep. Maybe it is all used up in time. Only empty, unclear skies lie ahead. Stretch our hand, the glass is burning hot, it's suddenly bright again. Eye-piercing light streaming through the window. Is it the sun or moonlight? 
the usual day and night hand in hand. Why blow nostril stinging smoke over here that refuses to be waved away? No longer any safe place to land. The backlit wing casts no shadow. Is it weightless? Though the clouds are beautiful, you don't want to live in them. The dots of light below increase in density, igniting a clamor of wordless worry. No, you must return to earth, dragging the burdens of home and country. Close sleek southern heat and humidity, the north's warm touching, travel documents with no permits, too many clothes, sweat builds to a sneeze on meeting over conditioned air, mindful of the surge of people cutting in line a 9.9 second dash toward immigration to become detailed yielding sausages. On the form, state, sex, passport number, destination, address, nationality. Mm, nationality. Your peripatetic narrative, written with such clever legality, i.e. irrelevant. No benefit to the world. Probably that's its biggest benefit. No, someone collected the benefit and left. Silence. You look at the desolate quiet outside. The now distant shadows of the clouds. Beautiful, but you can't live in them. Allow me to end by citing the last stanza of another poem, also on the ironies of history, about anxieties and inevitabilities of separation, self-imaginary definitions and wars from outside and from within. From the last stanza. You and us. As a piece played by Great Britain in the Pacific Ocean, a point we were abandoned by you because the chessboard is about using together, letting sold men and girls and middlemen and coolies raise a self-appointed hamlet of the empire on which the sun never sets. Do you or don't you want a father land? That may seem like a choice a choice open to the peoples of the world. But neither you nor we have ever been peoples. We are the letter bearing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. When the letter is opened, our heads will be chopped off. And this letter, this letter is called democracy. I wrote this when I woke up one day realizing Part of the problem of living in a post colony was that you too easily mistook yourself as a hamlet. When your mother has changed hands, your father has changed names, so you thought we are left with major decisions to make. To be or not to be. To kill yourself or the mother, the other, to leave on exile or stay as a shadow. But that illusion of being a center stage at the center of history or of poetry, if you like, is what I would call coloniality. After all, we are but Rosencrantz and Guildenstern the good-for-nothing muted stand-ins destined to deliver a letter with content never known to us, which we thought would elevate our futures, while it actually has for long sealed our possibilities. In poetry, though, perhaps we should be grateful that the historical, political, and cultural construction of this letter has granted us a vantage point to speak from to write about how, what, and how, uh, and why we are actually dead long before we learn to live. Thank you. Enjoy the festival. <laughs>